Fighting for the rights of older adults has been a passion of my next guest for many years. As our population ages, we are seeing more and more signs of elder abuse. We also have a health care system that is stretched to the limits as we all see and hear. And as a result, seniors become vulnerable. Well, thank goodness we have people like Maître Helen Gay to protect families and their loved ones. Maître Helen Gay is a prominent Montreal lawyer specializing in the rights of older adults. Maître Gay, welcome to Life Unrehearsed. Well, thank you very much, Matt, for this invitation. Thank you for coming into studio here and uh, drove down into studio uh, on a Bixie and doing, <laughs> enjoying this weather while you can. So, but uh, I know you are extremely busy um, advocating a lot for families, and, and I want to thank you really for coming into studio on, on such an important topic. We have a lot to cover on half a show here. So first of all, you're a lawyer specializing in the rights of older adults, and you're passionate about enabling this vulnerable population to be responsible. Uh, so what are some of the common issues that you're seeing facing older adults? Well, to start with, I, wish, I should say that I have most respect for older ad, towards older adults. Uh, my perspective is that every human being deserves respect. And uh, other adults as much as any other people, whether they are 68 or 86 years old. So seniors may be vulnerable at times. They are not at all of them vulnerable. But in my practice, I do see, I do meet see, uh, older adults that are being discriminated against, that are being ignore, ignored by caregivers, by their families, that are treated like a child by caregivers, that are being controlled by persons surrounding them uh, because they are diminished in their physical or psycho psychological capacity. You know, we hear the term elder abuse, it's a, it's a, it's a generic term, yet uh, there are different types of elder abuse. So maybe, uh, Maitre Gay, can, can you bring us through the different forms and types of elder abuse that you're seeing out there? Well, the, um, the definition of elder abuse has come many, many, many years ago, um, but we have been able to identify three, uh, three types, physical, emotional or psychological, and financial or material. And it might be expressed in terms of violence, so an act or an attitude, or it might be expected in expressed in a term in a term of inaction, so dig, neglect. For example, abandonment is a form of neglect. Mm -hmm. And according to the law in Quebec, maltreatment means a single or repeated act or lack of appropriate action that occurs in a relationship where there is an expectation of trust and that intentionally or unintentionally causes harm or distress to the older adult. Listening to Life Unrehearsed, Matt Del Vecchio here and talking with elder law lawyer Maitre Helen Gay. So the three types of abuse, physical, emotional, and financial. What would the most common type of elder abuse be in Canada? Uh, well, statistics report psychological abuse is the most important type of, of elder adult abuse in Canada. But older adults are more likely to report financial abuse. Mm -hmm. It occurs when an older adult, for example, is isolated after the death of his or her, her spouse, uh, which spouse is not in form of the couple's finances or unable to manage the finances, and where children and people around him or her would get involved and take an opportunity to use a power of attorney to make expenses in their interest rather than in the interest of the older adult. Or frequently also we see, and in my practice I see those cases where grandchildren or grandnephews or nieces solicit the older adult for financial help, uh, money for studies, money for their families, for their house, with a promise to reimburse mm -hmm. the older adult, which will never come. Never occurs, yeah. You know, it's interesting. It's, it's, we, we think of it as financial abuse, but like you're saying, psychological abuse is much more prevalent out there. And so there's the different types. From your perspective, Maitre Gay, how can we recognize potential abuse? Well, you're talking about psychological abuse for sure. Uh, when you manifestation of anguish, of fear, of depression is certainly symptoms of a, a, a real concern. Poor hygiene or symptoms of anxiety, um, being unable to explain a bank account or transactions in the in the bank account, or withdrawals um, 
from communication so the person does not communicate expresses her her opinions her her uh, feelings these would be uh, characteristics attached to an elder's victim. So the victim. Yeah. And then what about the characteristics of abusers? Yes. Well, again, and this goes for uh, professionals, uh, prof- health professionals identifying these uh, characteristics, but also courts coming also to reinforce the fact that we are able to identify some of these characteristics. So for elders' abuses, we find... Uh, very often the isolation of the person, locking the person, mm. uh, not permitting her to use the phone, cutting the phone line, not informing the other family members. R- the other Another aspect is very frequently seen is raising the voice, blaming, uh, ignoring the elder's request, the needs and the wishes, screaming at the, at the uh, older adult, or treating the adult without respect, such as using degrading expressions, uh, not providing what is necessary as food and and material for care and protection, or treating the elder in a way such that the elder will be feels threatened by the fact that he, he might, if he does not abide by the demand of this abuser, will end up in a long-term care residence, will end up not receiving the the, the help, not receiving the presence of this person. Uh, being uh, therefore uh, left to himself or herself. Um, so creating fear in a progressive manner is the way that we see it most of the time, and that is uh, clearly characteristics for such. I'm talking with Maitre Ellen Gay. She's an elder law lawyer uh, here on Life Unrehearsed. It's interesting, most of those examples you gave weren't even financial abuse. That's where you're seeing the psychological mm-hmm. abuse happening. Mm-hmm. And Okay, so let's say we, we recognize it. It could be a family member or, or, or uh, the victim themselves. What can we do about this? Uh, we recognize this. Usually what is being seen is a suspicion of uh, abuse huh? because it need to be identified. Maybe there's an explanation. Maybe there's a reason for. So therefore, once there is suspicion, maybe reporting would be the best. Reporting to the person who looks like, seems to be the abuser, discussing, bringing the, to the attention of this person. I have seen that she, she seems more anxious. Uh, are you aware of this withdrawal? Maybe there's an explanation for that. Maybe not. So adopting uh, such an attitude of uh, verification is is one step I recommend very strongly. And in fact, I had one case where the court... Uh, had blamed had blamed the nephews for not getting into contact while they both thought that they were suspicious one to towards the other suspicious of financial abuse and didn't talk to one another and the court concluded that it would have been a good thing to to proceed with also um anyone one has to remember that anyone who is suspicious of abuse towards a now an older adult may report and this includes caregivers um, so this uh, the the objective of reporting is really to put an end to the abuse. So if financial financial abuse is suspected at home, there are resources for people to communicate to 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 contact, such as the Human Rights Commission, such as the Elder Treatment Helpline, such as Tel Any such as the CLSC, so the Community Services Center. So four very good examples. I know we're throwing a lot of information out there. So um, I have posted on the Life Unrehearsed Facebook page those four organizations that you can call for suspect of elder abuse. The phone numbers will be there uh, as well. So you just simply have to go to the Life Unrehearsed Facebook page for all that. I have in studio with me Maitre Helen Gay. Maitre Gay is an elder law lawyer, and we we're just talking about all the different types of uh, recognizing elder, elder abuse and what can be done about it. Wonderful information there. I have posted all the contact information on the Life on Rehearse Facebook page. We're going to switch gears a bit here, Maitre Gay, because you are also involved in a lot of health law and medical malpractice. And um, perhaps can you give us a few examples of what you're seeing regarding medical malpractice? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, Matt, I've been, uh, since uh, the 80s, I've been filing claims for victims of negligence from health professionals, healthcare institutions, pharmaceutical companies, and others, dealing with consequences attached for the victims at, 
and making dramatic situations for them, dramatic outcome. I'll give you a few examples. Um, a doctor being blamed and condemned for not returning the patient's calls after cataract surgery and not making himself available to uh, address the problem and ultimately the patient ended up to losing one of her eyes. Um, another example would be um, a hospital being uh, held responsible for um, the, the fall of uh, the, um, a patient from the bed at time of uh, bed care uh, while this patient was actually the mother of my client who was his primary caregiver and who had with confidence said uh, to the hospital, could you please keep my mother for some respite during a short period of time? Very, very sad story. Um, uh, another example could be um, the wrong administration of a wrong medication that was wrongly prescribed, ending up to the death of a patient. Uh, in fact, not providing the full information to the patient, such as the risk attached to the medication, the risk of the treatment, the risk uh, that the manufacturer has to uh, attach to the medication or the, the April, is certainly also a very important uh, cause of uh, situations that could be avoided. Talking with Maitre Ellen Gay, an elder law lawyer here on Life Unrehearsed. Okay, and you know, you tend to think in Canada, we hear these enormous settlements in the U.S., but in Canada, ah, oh, no, this doesn't happen. But uh, I, I think what we want to do is let our listeners know um, you can deal with a medical malpractice and, and fight it, can't you? Yes, well, in the law, it's written black and white that uh, services must be provided with respect and continuity. And, you know, there is also a need to report. Reporting and expressing dissatisfaction are means to improve the system. And to my understanding, accepting the situation is certainly not the best option. We have to reveal these situations. And the law provides with means to reveal the situations to improve the system in a whole. All right, makes a lot of sense, and uh, yeah, let's not be afraid. And if you really do right. feel that something uh, is not right, um, you can fight it. Yeah. All right, I want to switch it up a little bit, Maitre Gay. You are dealing with the ad providing advice and recommendations, not just for older adults, but their children, the sandwich generation. So in general, uh, what suggestions can you give to all of us as we age? What questions should we be asking? Well, I, I sort of try... With my experience, I sort of uh, list a few questions and in, in order, uh, in the following order, I should say. What first question would be, what are my wishes for the coming years? Where do I want to live? Who is or who are my persons of confidence who will protect me in the future? Should I identify a person of confidence to assist me? Uh, should I review my will? Very interesting you mentioned that. We've had a couple of notaries on the show over the years, and I'm, I, it boggles my mind. More than 50% of Canadians still don't have a will. So I'm glad you brought that question up. Yes. Um, and should I uh, also make my children or persons close aware of my choices in my will? Because I see fights, many fights over the will and the distribution made at the time of the signature of the will. Or sh uh, next question could be also, should I sign a new power of attorney? Should I sign or renew my mandate in case of incapacity? Should I change them or should I prepare one? Uh, ultimately, what are my rights? The law, you know, the law has changed for the past 40 years in the practice. And I see that. And, and my contact with the with older adults may convince me that when one is is uh, in control of his or her rights, it empowers the person and it provides confidence for exercising and mm -hmm. having um, more protection. Talking with Maitre Ellen Gay, elder law lawyer here on Life Unrehearsed, you mentioned power of attorney and mandate of incapacity. It's now known as protection mandate. I know I get a lot of questions on 
this and what is the difference. So uh, I know I'm going to put you on the spot here to explain this in a, about a minute or so, but what is the difference between a power of attorney and a protection mandate? Well, the difference is to me quite clear in the following sense. A power of attorney, both are mandates to start with. So it means that we confer to a person some duties, some authorities, some uh, things to perform. The power of attorney is the document or mandate by which I design one or more than one person for assistance in the administration of my finances while I am still legally capable of deciding. While the protection mandate, and you identified very clearly, we used to call it mandate in case of incapacity, is is this mandate or this document that I assign in eventuality of my incapacity to decide, in case I become incapable to decide. It is meant to provide the name, again, of one or more person who will make decisions after the incapacity to decide or the incapacity to administer my own affairs will be declared, both medically and legally, and after the mandate has been homologated, which is a legal step. So the power of attorney, I may sign and I may use it right away, while the mandate, while the protection mandate needs that this event occurs, the event of incapacity. So it might never occur or it may occur one day, and yet it's going to be useful. Both documents are useful um, and both documents should serve for ensuring the protection and at the same time safeguard of autonomy of the person who is signing it. I think excellent explanation. Both are important. Um, you want to be control of what people are going to do in making decisions for you. And so power of attorney, while you are apt, protection mandate is if you become inapt, both extremely important. Maitre Gay, we're already out of time. So much information. Love to have you back again. And uh, I want to thank you for coming in the studio here on Life Unrehearsed. My pleasure. Thank How you so much. can our listeners reach you? Phone number 514-272-1164. Email or website, elengui.com. Email address, hguay at h-e-l-e-n-e-g-u-a-y.com. Your website is excellent. I'm going to just repeat that. It's, it's elengui.com, so h-e-l-e-n-e-g-u-a-y.com. And by the way, just a reminder, everything is posted on the Life Under Her's Facebook page, those elder abuse hotline numbers. And if you need to reach Maitre Gay, her contact information is there. Again, thank you very much, Maitre Gay. Thank you so much, Matt.